we are... Hold on. Oh, wait. We can't see anything. There we go. That's so much better now, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, guys. How you doing? We're here for night two of our 30-minute read. Two. And then the night three is tomorrow. Right? Maybe. Maybe tomorrow. WrestleMania is going on. It's going to be interesting to see what they're going to do. So maybe I'll... Like this one, I'll record it and then just put it up for anybody to watch whenever you like. Again, it's going to be about 30 minutes of The Hobbit. I got Captain Rob with me. Yeah. So he's going to sit quietly and listen to me uh, read the story with voices. <laughs> and just as a little like update uh, from night one, we met Bilbo. We walked into his house under the hill. We met Gandalf. And we met... All the dwarves. Let's see. Do you remember their names? No. No? no? Okay. All right. There's Thorin. There's Feely. Keely. Balin. Dwalin. Oin. Gloin. Dory. Nori. Ori. Biffer. Bofer. Bumber. <laughs> That's their names. So. All right. You ready to do this? Why yeah. don't you go have a seat? We'll be nice and relaxed for all this. Oh, and you know what? Hey. Yeah, wake up. Wake up. <laughs> just wanted to show off my own little Gimli. Yeah, I just woke you up and you're you're frightened out of your mind. Look at that tongue. He's... We named you after a dwarf. How you doing? Here, I love you too. Okay, go back to sleep. <laughs> All right. Let's find our place in the book. And we'll get started. Bless you. Alright. Uh, just trying to find... Okay. Alright, so, yeah, all the dwarves have just come into Bag End or Bilbo's house. I actually haven't seen it referred to as Bag End in the book. But we all know it as Bag End. That's what it is. Gimli just got comfortable and jumped on Robbie's lap. <laughs> as, as he should. Alright, here we go. Now we are all here. Oh, wait. Gandalf voice. Now we are all here, sang Gandalf, looking at the row of 13 hoods. The best detachable party hoods. The best detachable party hoods. I didn't read that wrong. That's what it says. And his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. I hope there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No, thank you. A little red wine, I think, for me. And for me, said Thorin. I know they sound alike. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Biffer. And mince pies and cheese, said Bomba. And pork pie and salad, said Bomba. And more cake and ale and coffee. And if you don't mind called the other dwarves throughout the door. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him, as the hobbit stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know as much about the inside of my ladders as I do myself, thought B Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed, and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his own house. By the time he had gotten all the bottles, and dishes, and knives, and forks, and glasses, and plates, and spoons, and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot, and red in the face, and annoyed. All three at once. Confusicate and be bother these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend me a hand? Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen, and Feely and Keely behind them, and before he could say knife, they had whisked of the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set everything out afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party with the thirteen dwarves all around, and Bilbo sat at the stool next to the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away at this point. And taking a look as if he would, and, and trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate 
and ate, and talked and talked, and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back, and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. I suppose you all want to stay for supper, he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin, and after, we shan't get through the business till late, and we must have some music first. Now cheer up! Oh boy, you know what's coming if you know this story. <clears throat> Thereupon the twelve dwarves, not Theorin, not Thorin, he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet and made tall pipes of all things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on top, with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright, Please be careful, and don't, please don't trouble, I can manage. But the dwarves only started to sing. Ah, here we go. Chip the glasses, crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggin hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and tread the flat. Pour the milk in pantry floor. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. <laughs> Some of this is a little tricky. <laughs> Leave the bones on the mat. Splash the wine on every door. Dump the crocks onto the floor. Pound them with the thumping pole, and when you're finished, we, if we are whole, send them down the hand to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates, so carefully, carefully with the plates. Alright, that's not the song you're probably anticipating. <laughs> and of course, they did none of these dreadful things, and everything was cleaned and put away safe, quick as lightning. While the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing... They then went back and forth, Thorn with his feet on the fender, smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke, smoke rings, and whether he told one to go, it went. Up the chimney, or behind the clock on the mantelpiece, or under the table, or round and round the ceiling. But whatever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of Thorin's smokes, smoke rings. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them above him already, and in the dim light, in the dim light, it made him look. Uh, let me do that again. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light it made him look strange and sorcerous for a wizard. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings, and then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning with the smoke rings that he sent up over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorin. Bring out the instruments. Keely and Feely rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Biffer and Bofer went out too and came back with clarinets that they had left among the walking sticks. Dalin and Bla Balin said, Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. They came back with vials as big as themselves and with Thorin's harp wrapped in green cloth. It was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorn struck it, the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet, that Bilbo forgot everything else, and was swept away into the dark lands under the strange moons, far over the water, and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from a little window that opened on the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and they still they played on while the shadow of Gandalf's beard waggled against the wall. The dark filled all of the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on. And suddenly, first one and then another began to sing, as they played deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be their song without music. 
Let's get another drink before we do this, because this looks like a whole page and a half. <clears throat> there we go. You ready? Yeah. All I'm right. Ready. You're ready. Far over the misty mountains cold To dungeons deep and caverns old We must away every break of day To seek the pale enchanted gold The dwarves of yore made mighty spells While hammers fell like ringing bells in places deep where dark things sleep in hollowed halls beneath the fells <clears throat> more for ancient king and elvish lord there many a gleaming gloat golden hoard they shaped and wrought and light they caught to hide in gems on hilt of sword. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him. A fierce and a jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something tookish awoke inside of him, and he wished to go to see the great mountains and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of dwarves shining in dark caverns. Suddenly, in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up. Probably somebody lighting a wood fire. And he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all to flames. He shuddered, and very quickly he was plain Mr. Baggins of Bag End, Underhill again. Hey, there's our first reference of Bag End. What do you think of my singing? Um, it's pretty good. For dwarf singing. Um, well. Alright, I'm going to keep going, okay? okay. Alright. He got up trembling, had less than half of a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half of a mind to pretend to go and hide behind the bear, beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly he found out that the music and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him, with eyes shining in the dark. "'Where are you going?' said Thorin, in a tone that seemed to be that he guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. What about a little light, said Bilbo, apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before the dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shovel with a crash. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf Dwarves and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in this house of our friend and fellow conspirator, the most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. He paused for a breath and for a polite remark from the hobbit, but the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was waging his mouth waging his mouth in protest at being called audacious and worst of all fellow conspirator though no noise came out he was so flummoxed so thorn went on and i need her we are met to discuss our plans our ways our means policy and devices we shall soon before the break of day start our long journey a journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, except our friend and counselor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Our object is, I take it, well known to us all, to the esteemable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves. I think 
I should be right in naming Keeley and Feely, for instance. The exact situation at that moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thorin's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath. Without any of... Without telling anyone there was anything that was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At it, at it may never return, he began to feel a shriek coming up from inside, and soon it burst out like a whistle of an engine out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and its firework glared. And its firework glare, the poor little hobbit could hardly be seen kneeling on the hearth rug, shaking like a jelly that was melted. Then he fell flat on the floor and kept calling out, Struck by lightning! Struck by lightning! Over and over again. And it was all they could do to get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out the way on the dwar dwarving room sofa. Dwarving? Okay. On the dwarving room sofa. I guess it was built by dwarves. Uh, with a drink in his elbow, and they went back to their dark business. Excitable little fellow, said Gandalf, as they sat down again. Gets funnier, f strange fits, but he is one of the best. One of the best, and fierce as a dragon in any pinch. If you have ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this is only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit. Even to old Tok great-grand-uncle Bull Roarer. Bill Bull Roarer. That's a name. So, Old Took's great-grand-uncle Bull Roarer is his name. Who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a full-grown horse. He charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Green Fields and knocked their king Glum Fimble's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole. And in this way, the battle was won and the game of golf was invented at the same moment. That's what that line's from. <laughs> so he knocked a goblin's head off into a rabbit hole, won the battle and said, hey, let's make a sport out of that. I, I get golf, golf outing? Golf outing? Yeah, <laughs> Make, go to war and invent a sport, sure. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Roarer's gentler descendant was reviving on the drawing, on the dwarving room. After a while and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard, Gloin speaking, Hrumph, or some snort, more or less. Will he do, do you think? It is all very well for Gandalf to talk about his hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragons and all his relatives and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. In fact, it had not been for the sign of the door, I should have not been sure we had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clasped my eyes on the little fellow huffing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a bulger. Burglar. Yes, I can read. <laughs> then Mr. Baggins turned his handle and went in. The took side had won. He suddenly felt as if he would go without bed and breakfast to be fought fierce. As for little fellow hobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards, the Baggins part regurgitated what he did now and what he said to himself Bilbo you were a fool you walked right in and put your foot in it pardon me he said if I have overheard words that you were saying I don't pretend to understand what you're talking about or your reference to burglars but I think I am right in believing this is what he called being on his dignity that you think I am no good I will show you that I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I am quite sure that you have come to the wrong house. 
As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts, but treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I will have to walk from here to east of east and fight in the wild wereworms in the last desert, I have the great, great, great grand uncle once bull roarder took and... Yes, yes, yes. That was a long time ago, said Gloin. I was talking about you. And I assure you there is a mark on this door. The unusual one in the trade, or used to be. Burglar wants a good job. Plenty of excitement and reasonable reward. That's how it really... It, that is how it usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. And it's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there is a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting where Wednesday tea time. Of course there is a mock, said Gandalf. I put it there myself for very good reasons. You asked me to find the 14th man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let any one of you say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at 13 and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal." He scowled angrily at Gloin. The dwarf huddled back in his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy eyebrows, till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. "'That's right,' said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be when the time comes. There is a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more than he has of any of himself. You may all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a little light on this. On the table... In the light of the big lamp, with a red shade, he spread a piece of parchment, kind of like a map. This was made by Thorar, your grandfather Thorin. He said, I hope I said that right, because there's like five R's in it. Uh, he, he said in answer to the dwarves' excited questions, It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that with this... I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin, disappointingly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands around it, and I know where Mirkwood is, and where the withered hearth is, and where the great dragon bred. There is a dragon marked in red on the mountain, said Balin, but it will easily be enough to find him without that if we ever arrive there. Is Gimli getting crazy on you? All right, let's um, let's let him rest, okay? Let him sleep. He's old and he's tired. Uh, there is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard, and that is the secret entrance. You see that rune on the west side and the hand pointing to it from the other runes? That mark a hidden passage to the lower halls. Look at the map at the beginning of this book, or like, the images when it pops up, which should be soon if it didn't just go by. It may have been a secret once, said Thorne, but how do we know that the secret it is a secret any longer? Old Smog has lived there long enough now to find anything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it's too small. Five feet high, the door and three may walk abreast, say, under the runes. But Smog could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon, certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons, but only hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and his hall was hung one large of the country road with all his favorite walks marked on red ink. How could such a large door be kept secret from anybody outside apart from the dragon, he asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf. 
in but in what way this one has been hidden we don't know without going to see from what it says on the map i should guess there is a closed door that has been made to look exactly like the side of the mountain that is the usual dwarves method i think that is right isn't it quite right said thorin also went gandalf i forgot to mention with that the map went a key a small and curious key. Here it is, he said. He handed Thorn a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorn, and he fastened it upon a fine chain that hung around his neck under his jacket. Now things began to look more hopeful. The news alters them much for the better. So far we have no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the Long Lake. After that, the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf. We might go from there up along the river running, went on Thorin, taking no notice. And so the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. But none we of us like the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it, through the great cliffs at the south of the mountain. And out of it comes the dragon too, far less often, unless he has changed his habits. <laughs> you getting bored? Are you still with me? I am still with you. You're still you. with me? <laughs> All right. Gimli? Gimli's taking over the chair, huh? Yeah. Yeah, yes. come on, Gimli. Come on, let's get you down. Robbie needs to use that chair. Go on out. Go on out. And I got messages going off. Let's mute that for the time being. Okay. All right, almost there. <clears throat> uh, let's see if he's changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard. Not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands. And in this neighborhood, heroes are scarce, or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees, and shields as cradles or dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off, and therefore legendary. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins, the burglar, the chosen, chosen and selected burglar. So now let's get on and make some plans. Very well then, said Thorn. Supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions, he turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First, I would like to know a bit more about things, he said, feeling all confused and a little bit shaky inside, but so far still tookerishly determined to go on with things. I mean, about the gold and the dragon and all that. How it got there, and who it belongs to, and so on and further. Bless me, said Thor. Haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? We haven't been talking all about this for hours. All the same, I should like it all plain and clear, said <laughs> said Bilbo, putting on his business manner, usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off of him, and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional to live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I would like to know about risks, out-of-pocket -po expenses, time required, remuneration, and so forth, by which he meant, why am I going, what am I going to get out of it, and am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago, in my grandfather Thor's time, our family was driven out by the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Thrain the Old, but now they mined and they tunneled and they made hunger halls. Huger halls. Hunger. Hunger halls. What's a hunger hall? <laughs> And filled with food. 
That's what I would think that is. But this isn't a hunger hall. It is a huger hall and a greater workshop. In addition, I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous. And my grandfather was king under the mountain again and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived to the south and were gradually spreading up the, ri the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in the days. Kings used to send for smiths and, e and reward even the least skilled most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Dwarves aren't really known for farming. They're known for mining. merchandising and mining, yeah. Although those were good days for us, and the poor of us had money to spend and to lend and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it, not to speak the most marvelous and magic of toys, the like of which were not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cups and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the North. So the toy market of Dale is basically your, a, your toy shop for dwarf kids? They, well, not only dwarf kids, but uh, the city of Dale was a city of men. And they, they benefited off uh, the dwarves who were very pos prosperous and they were and they paid them with both money and food so the dwarves didn't have to farm themselves so this became like a big almost an empire i'm starting to think why they did they not over here have, i'm trying to think why they didn't have uh, food halls now yeah oh hunger halls <laughs> yeah <laughs> that would be funny but that's going we're going to stop it right there for right now that's night two of our Hobbit read. They just did the backstory of the mountain city and the city of Dale. They sang, they drank, they ate, and now they're getting ready for an adventure. So that is going to... And probably they're going to get drunk before. They're probably going to get drunk. They are dwarves. It is possible. So that's going to do it for night two, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me, Rob. I hope... Did you enjoy the little you got to I... hear tonight? <laughs> Yeah, it was actually pretty relaxing. For a few moments, I actually started to fall asleep. But my, I woke my up before I even closed my eyes. Well, I hope nobody else fell asleep while watching. <laughs> I wasn't bored. It was just relaxing. It was relaxing? Well, that's good to hear. All right. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for joining. And we'll do night three uh, either this weekend or first thing on Monday. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much, guys. Can't wait to read some more.